Well, I'd like to thank the organisers for posing me um, uh, a real challenge in this fascinating uh, melange of different uh, ways of thinking, feeling, uh, and politicising around uh, ideas of uh, cracking the contemporary. I am in uh, this morning's melange, the social scientist between the two philosophers. And um, I'm sure we'll generate some interesting uh, variations on a theme as a consequence. But I, I want to pick up very directly on one aspect at least of David's um, first talk. Uh, in, a, in a rather more mundane and everyday sense, I'm also going to be dealing with the cracks open up in catastrophic, uh, through catastrophic events. But the catastrophes that I want to talk about are environmental catastrophes. Uh, so I want to talk about uh, the idea of natural hazards um, and think uh, about various ways in which the geopolitics of natural hazards uh, are, are being remade. And this is uh, an argument, too, though uh, from a very different direction, that I think intersects with those ideas uh, that both uh, that David set up about um, how we imagine and indeed make futures. So the example that I'm going to take uh, in the talk today is flooding, um, probably the most ubiquitous. It's been with us a very long time, this a 14th century German woodcut. Uh, of floods, um, when, uh, in a time when extreme weather events uh, like flooding uh, were very much seen as, as, as perils um, in which the uh, social responses uh, relied very heavily on various forms, uh, modes and practices of supplication to creator deities um, for whom these kinds of events were seen to be a product of the will of those uh, creative forces or deities. We've clearly come a long way since then. Today, these kinds of environmental uh, hazards and catastrophes, like flooding, generate a whole a set of different political responses. We can think about responses around uh, global climate change denial. Are we getting a greater frequency and more intense uh, extreme weather events today because we have changed uh, the climate? or not. Uh, that's often one of the kinds of geopolitical issues in dispute when these events occur. Or an example in the UK, um, very much affected by floods over the last several years, although thus far, and I shouldn't tempt fate, uh, we have got off quite lightly this year. Um, the kinds of geopolitical forces that are brought to bear are around how are the government agencies responsible for trying to keep us safe uh, from these hazards. Um, are we doing sensible things there? And in the case of the UK, right at the timing of the uh, last round of very severe and widespread flooding in, uh, in uh, the UK back in the uh, early winter of 2016, uh, the government announced a second round of very penetrating cuts to the very agencies that try uh, to predict and manage flood risk. So those kinds of geopolitical acts come up. But the one that I really want to focus on today is, is this massive shift in the way in which we think uh, about these extreme weather events and indeed react to them, how they enter our psyche. We've moved from the idea that they are, if you like, acts of the will of a creator god uh, to the idea uh, that uh, society, particularly governments, uh, as these intersect with various forms of expert knowledge, can manage these risks. And we look to those authorities and scientific agencies uh, to do just that. Now, for me, these environmental catastrophes like flooding, particularly as we've turned our attention to the notion that they uh, we, we ought to be relying on someone to manage them for us, uh, introduces, I think, a very interesting take on this notion that the, the uh, organisers have brought together today of the idea of cracks in the contemporary. Do environmental dis disturbances generate exactly these kinds of cracks for us to uh, rethink and reimagine and indeed remake uh, our relationship not only to 
uh, the earth, earthly powers around us, but to the making of our futures. And I want to hear um, use the work uh, of, of Isabel Stengers, who I think has some very interesting ideas as to just what kinds of cracks might open up politically in these moments. If we take seriously, she suggests, those non-humans that are best characterised as forth forcing thought, what we need to think about and address is not the empty generality of humans as thinking beings, but what causes them to think and to object. Humans who affirm that their freedom lies in their refusal to break this attachment, even in the name of some common good. And that's going to be the focus of the rest of my talk. Because in these kinds of environmental disturbances, the, the, the most ready one of flooding that I'm looking at here, one of the things precisely that those disturbances do is disturb uh, the taken for granted uh, fabric of the world in which we live. And in particular, they raise questions these days about just how natural these supposedly natural hazards actually are. So in the case of communities that get regularly flooded in the UK, and this photograph of people with tea, so you know it's from the UK, uh, could be um, just about taken anywhere around the country. The kinds of questions that, as a researcher, you encounter when you go and work in these communities are actually pretty much the same, and they cover a couple of things. Why do they, that's the experts, keep saying it's a one in a hundred year event when we've been flooded twice in five years? In other words, there's something about the, man the people responsible for managing these events um, that does not seem to be going right. Or on a second kind of tack, we're the ones with the experience of flooding. Why aren't the experts interested in what we know? Why doesn't anyone ever come to talk to us? Why doesn't anybody ever want to know uh, what we understand about our local area? So those are the kinds of very prosaic issues in communities that uh, live with flooding and flood risk that um, that notion of crack uh, generated by environmental disturbances opens up. And one of the reasons that uh, a group of researchers, humanities uh, researchers, scientists who model floods and social scientists that I've long worked with became interested in, in Stenger's work is the emphasis that, it's pla that it places uh, and the project that as she's named it is, uh, is one of experimental constructivism. It's the emphasis that, that, that it places on what can we do as in these moments of disturbance in opening up those cracks, in exploiting those cracks to make political changes in the way that we make our futures. The experimental ethos in this project of experimental constructivism stresses then that there are conditions and possibilities precisely occurring in these cracks of subjecting expert practices and propositions to various forms of public trial. And in turn, those possibilities of subjecting expert propositions and practices to forms of public trial can only be realized if we uh, can elaborate and experiment with new forms of uh, apparatus, the invention of apparatuses that enable those who live with these uh, disturbances, and in the case of the uh, talk that I'm uh, doing today, uh, of, of living with flood risk, uh, they can actually uh, include or open up expert reasoning uh, to interrogation by the communities that live with these risks. Can we actually, in other words, invent experimental apparatuses that open up the political space, the political crack that emerges in the event of environmental disturbances like flooding? And so uh, together with now numerous communities around the UK who live with flooding, this um, research team that I've been working with over about 12 years now um, has been exactly trying to do that, invent apparatuses with which we can undertake experiments in public uh, reasoning around the nature of so-called environmental, uh, of so-called natural hazards like flooding, flooding and turn them uh, the, the focus of interrogation away from uh, thinking of these as acts of God and towards rather thinking about precisely the body of expert knowledge uh, on which the decisions of government where it invests in flood defences, where it doesn't, 
uh, how well it predicts flood events, how well it doesn't, and so on. It puts the onus of public interrogation um, on those intermediaries, those scientific or expert intermediaries, in the making of futures. I won't, for the purpose of this audience, dwell on the complex ways in which um, the expert knowledge that informs uh, efforts to manage flood risk are uh, primary, primarily um, mediated by various components of modelling. Mathematical modelling, computer modelling, um, with all, which, all of which then refer back to data being generated by really quite fallible infrastructures of instrumentation, from rain gauges and river gauges trying to measure the flow of water in a river, to various forms of re remotely sensed data to do with topography and other elements that go in to try and anticipate the way in which uh, hydrological regimes, that is, the land, what comes out of the sky, and the nature of rivers and the movement of water across a landscape, all come together. The idea being that you can say something about the future on the basis of how a particular hydrological system has operated in the past. But the key point that I want to make here is that in these cracks, in the event of environmental disturbances, like flooding events, what in particular gets opened up for local communities living with those events and having to deal with them um, is just the role and the, uh, the, the component parts, if you like, of this techno-scientific expertise that's uh, relied upon um, uh, by all of us, but certainly by, by the government agencies we look to, uh, to try and solve these kinds of environmental problems. And this, these various forms of techno-scientific expertise, in the case of flood risk uh, modelling in particular, become apprehended and, and open to interrogation as co a constitutive component of the very environmental problems they're supposed to settle. In other words, it makes these expert systems become a crucial focus of analytical and political concern. That is, what we, that is one of the ways in which we can exploit these particular kinds of crack. So as I indicated, we've been doing um, a lot of work on, on, on trying to stage these public experiments, bringing together communities living with flood risk with some of the scientific practices that inform the way in which flood risk is managed by various state authorities. Um, we must have run about um, 10 or 11 now. Um, but just to give you a flavor of the kinds of um, activities that these experiments in, in public reasoning um, take up. These are all examples from some work that we did um, in, a, in the north of England um, in a town called Pickering in Yorkshire. Uh, for those who don't know it, it's a, uh, it's a very upland area. It's, an, it's a national park. It's an area of uh, great beauty, relies very heavily on tourism and agriculture. And it's also an area that suffers almost uh, extremely regularly from catastrophic catastrophic levels of flooding. So what are some of the things that we can do in uh, exploiting these uh, cracks uh, in the event of uh, floods in bringing uh, community experience and uh, flood risk modelers together? One of the, uh, the key uh, things that we work on is uh, generating confidence in communities to question expert knowledge. And so this is a classic example. Um, the models that are used by, in the UK context, the Environment Agency, um, produce maps of recent flood events. And this was a map of a very uh, a particularly catastrophic flood event in the town of Pickering. And all the gray areas that you can see on this map are where uh, the Environment Agency model indicated had been flooded. Um, and what you can see superimposed on that is a sort of series of different kinds of cross-hashed, uh, hand-written uh, uh, um, uh, elements. And that's where various people who lived through this particular flood event are correcting uh, the model-generated map. They are identifying areas that the model-generated map said flooded and didn't, and they are also identifying areas that the uh, model generated map said um, didn't flood and did. So that notion that the ways in which we produce literally the cartography, 
of what a flood event is in a particular place, um, relies on particular ways of generating that knowledge, many of those remotely sensed, and not aligning with the actual experience of living through this flood event on the ground is a very important opening point to be able to start interrogating politically um, dissonances, if you like, in perspective on how knowledge is produced. A second kind of thing that we often do in these groups, I and mean, they all have their own dynamics, so they, they, they go in different directions, but very often people want to try out, um, well, uh, the experts haven't built us a flood wall, or um, they uh, have told us that we shouldn't expect flooding here other than on a very uh, intermittent period, um, but we keep on being flooded. And we think we've got some ideas better than theirs that we'd like to try out. Um, this is a bit of an in-joke in the UK, so I'll just explain. What about dredging? Um, whether you're in an upland area or uh, an area like Somerset that also flooded catastrophically recently, um, which is well below sea level, an area called the Somerset Levels, um, there's, a, there's a sort of instinctive sense among many people who live through those events uh, that actually the easiest thing to do, if only the experts would fund it, um, would be simply to dredge the entire river system down to the sea. Uh, and obviously, if you make more capacity in the rivers, then the water will drain off faster, so the logic goes. So one of the things that we've been uh, developing, and it's different in each case, um, but loosely what you can see here is a, is a classic kind of visualization intermediary. Um, the dark area... Uh, or the darkest area in the centre is, roughly speaking, uh, the catchment in the case of Pickering. So where do all the waters that fall onto the landscape that end up uh, flooding Pickering in the event of a flood? Um, what's the shape of that landscape? Uh, what are the various tributaries and rivers and the conditions of, the, uh, of, the, of that landscape that the water moves over? And you can also see that um, there are crosshairs. The colours basically mean likelihood of flooding, volume of water, speed of movement of the water. And this is a device that enables people to try out their pet theories about what would improve the management of flood risk uh, in their local areas. You can put in different interventions. So, for example, you could put in dredging the river all the way down to the sea. Uh, you can see whether it works or not. Usually it doesn't. Uh, and often when it does, equally importantly, you can see that one of the effects... Uh, is that it might improve your flood risk in your particular neighbourhood or street. Um, but one of the effects is simply to displace that flood risk uh, to another neighbourhood or street not currently affected by flooding. So it's a device for people to try out their ideas, uh, to see how they compare with the sorts of uh, ideas that expert flood managers have come up with. In the case of Pickering, and in several of the cases that we've been working on since, most recently uh, in another uh, market town um, near Leeds called Otley, these kinds of experiments in public reasoning um, can come up with new ideas for how to manage flood risk. In other words, new proposals for remaking these landscapes and by definition remaking the futures of flood risk in these localities. In the Pickering case, uh, it didn't take very many uh, meetings of this uh, collaborative group to come up with the idea that it's a bit late to be trying to manage flood risk by building a wall in the town, which is what uh, the Environment Agency had proposed and then couldn't fund because it was too expensive, leaving the town without any flood defences at all. And what people figured out um, uh, through after about three meetings uh, playing around with the um, visualization device, was that actually that wasn't where you needed to intervene at all. If you intervened higher up in the catchment, so-called upstream storage, um, this is a picture of up in the catchment, you can see it's very heavily wooded, um, you could actually slow up the flow of water off this steep landscape uh, so that it doesn't all converge just outside the town and flood it regularly. We produced some modelling from that, uh, modelling being the only currency for the uh, agencies that manage flood risk in the UK uh, that they take seriously. We produced some modelling of this so-called upstream storage solution. 
And to cut a very long story short, in, uh, I hope, uh, a manner uh, well aligned with the notion of experimental constructivism, this is what we made. So after some years and much politics, um, the idea of upstream storage um, is now uh, in situ in the landscape. And a whole series um, up in the uplands of uh, these so-called woody debris dams are now in situ. Uh, local volunteers contributed to building them. Various other government agencies like the Forestry Commission were also involved. Uh, and an important aspect of this is that if you were to put that image up in another context, they would, for all the world, look like the architecture of beaver dams. And in the final twist in the tale, literally as I was coming over yesterday in the plain, uh, I was reading a piece in the um, only newspaper available uh, on British Airways, uh, that is the Daily Telegraph, uh, that um, indeed various counties now in England are thinking of reintroducing beavers to build these dams as a way of managing flood risk without us having to do it for ourselves. So I just want to end then by drawing us back in what I hope I've wor uh, worked through example of just what you can make uh, in the event, in, in the cracks that open up in the event uh, of flooding or environmental disturbances of that kind. If we take seriously those non-humans that are best characterised as forcing thought, what we need to think about and address is not the empty generality of humans as thinking beings, but what causes them to think and to object. Humans who affirm that their freedom lies in their refusal to break this attachment, even in the name of some common good. Thank you. can stay for <laughs> for a minute for <laughs> uh, for questioning yeah it's a bit uh, uh, <clears throat> we can take questions from from the from the audience as well i have a question too um, in a way now what you described is is about the humans and their agency let's say um, would you also think of the maps and the cartography as agents in this whole rethinking of things? So I think I'd, uh, my, my take on this is that um, I think the ability to rethink and remake uh, flood risk landscapes, by which I mean both physical landscapes in space, but also uh, temporal landscapes in managing the future uh, or, or making futures, um, is always that the agency of doing that is always distributed. Uh, humans can't do it without a whole series of other things. And it's that assemblage, that, that combination, if you like, that in different circumstances enables us to produce different results, us being the, 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 the composite. Um, so that would be my answer. Yeah. That, that, that it, it's, it, the agency is distributed. Thank you. Um, are there questions from, from the audience? So it would be good to take some time for that too. Yeah, oh, sorry, I, uh, I overlooked you. I will, I will bring you a... Uh, yeah. Hi, thanks for the presentation. Um, would you be able to say something more about um, the relationship between uh, authoritative figures like uh, scientific institutions and local governments? and uh, knowledge production and the way this creates um, either relationships of uh, uh, resistance and conflict, uh, but also at the same time the creation that opens up the possibility of creating new subjects. So citizens that are actually uh, no longer uh, the passive recipients of policies, uh, but actually um, uh, inform them. Um, so, to what extent this is changing authorities or uh, or, or ex an established regime of knowledge uh, in in the work you are doing? Thanks. Thank you very much. Yes, that's uh, actually one of the key themes that, that we've worked on. So, um, that that's a very good question. Um, the the approach that we take is that uh, the, the the regime that tries. Um, 
or is, is authorised, as it were, um, in, in uh, contemporary societies to attempt to manage flood risk, this, this um, hybrid, if you like, between scientific expertise and policy-making expertise, um, establishes, uh, it's a regime that is, in essence, about expert planetary management. We can model everything from the climate to um, the impacts of rainfall through a landscape, and through those modeling activities, we can make futures. We can make some futures more possible and other futures less possible. And that this is a socio-technical um, capacity or capability um, that is a product of the bringing together of these different kinds of expertise. So that's a regime of planetary management. And in essence, I think what many of the experiments that, that we've been trying to run uh, are seeking to do is to say, yeah, there's another way uh, of coming at this. And it's almost certainly a way that's about the interstices. It's not about um, making a new planetary management regime. It's about communities trying to make um, that component of the Earth with which they're most familiar, the environment in which they experience something like flood uh, risk, uh, more amenable to their input and understandings. Um, so that a lot of uh, our activity is, uh, uh, nowadays, the, the, the example that I gave you was one where we researchers went into a community that we knew had been flooded and was very unhappy with the way that flood risk was managed for them. Um, and we run that experiment. These days, we are called in by communities to do this. And it is absolutely now reaching the point where uh, we are trying to work with a, a group of communities to make this something that every community who experiences flood risk can do for themselves, to map and model um, the flood risk dynamics in their particular place uh, on their own terms and to come up with novel solutions. With another hat and um, it, almost in another life, I also now spend quite a lot of my time trying to work with the government authorities to get them to invest in the solutions that communities come up with. Very crudely, I think that's very, very difficult at a national level. These agencies are very wedded to the notion that they are in control of how you do this. But at the local level, local uh, environment agency staff now, uh, having seen some of the successes of the past, are um, increasingly interested in working with communities rather than simply imposing on them something that their models have generated. Thank you. Does that answer your question? Yeah. Good. Um, okay, I think we can... If there's no more from the audience... Yeah, there is. Good. Yeah, a question about climate change denial that you said quite near the beginning. <coughs> I was wondering if in the rural communities that you work with, the fact that there is more frequent flooding means that they're less likely to deny climate change, even though there's more of a correlation in rural areas with voting for parties that endorse climate change denial. Yeah, um, good question. Uh, a friend of mine, um, environmental psychologist called Nick Pigeon, has actually done quite a big piece of work looking at the connection between um, people's experience in environmental disturbance, of which the most frequent one in the UK is flooding, um, and uh, opinions and views about uh, climate change. And what I think he's shown um, pretty conclusively, uh, it's on a very large scale, the study that he's, he, he ran, um, is that the more, the greater your experience of these kinds of environmental disturbances or flood events, um, the more likely you are to take seriously um, problems and issues associated with climate change and to see them um, as increasingly a product of human activity in themselves. Um, so there's quite a strong correlation between those two things in the work that he's done. Thank you, Sarah. That Thank was you. great.